Good morning, uh, Hope Chapel. <laughs> Tilden jumped the gun. Good morning, Hope Chapel. For those of you that are guests here, my name is Gino. It's, it's not a common Central Texas name, but it is my name. And it's, it's okay. Somebody told me just the other day, he said, I was up in uh, the Northeast, and there were Genos on every corner. And I said, yeah, that's right. Just like there are, is it short? No, it's just short. I, I wanted to uh, say that we have a bunch of these booklets in the, in the foyer. I got a second shipment. So don't be afraid to take two or three and hand them out to your friends. What's After Life? And invite them to read this short little booklet. It's a, 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 a subset of the, the, the stories in Imagine Heaven by John Burke. And uh, we're going be, to begin uh, Easter Sunday, a series on uh, the subject of heaven. Actually, life after life after life. And what's the... Yeah. Yeah, anyway, there's an intermediate state in there. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, but we're going to talk about what we have to look forward to with Christ forever. Uh, but anyway, this book is a, a, um, a series of stories about near-death experiences or NDEs. Uh, make up your own mind whether you think it's uh, worth your time in terms of, of believing those things. But we have in our midst several people, a handful of people, who had their own near-death experience um, with a bright light or a warm uh, person, personal presence or... Uh, that's that sort of thing. So um, a significant percent, a small percent, but significant percent of people in our, in our population have had these and around the globe as well. So there are some pe- preachers who say, hey, this is God's door, that, to uh, open door to talk to people that are far from God or don't believe at all uh, about things that are important, the afterlife and whether there is life after death, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I tend to think that's a good idea. Uh, I'm not going to preach that as a theology or a theological statement. I don't, I don't think I can. I don't think there's enough substance there. But it's an interesting thing. I read this and I read the big book. Good stuff. So get, get yourself a copy. Uh, we're providing them free. Uh, please get one and, and uh, start a little book club at work or in your home. Just read through it. It won't, doesn't take long. And then um, uh, these are, I assume these are your friends. I'm, I'm assuming that you won't be inviting people you don't know, never met, into your home. But that would be cool if you're that kind of person. May the Lord increase your tribe. But uh, bring your friends uh, into, your, into your space. Talk about these things. And if you can get them to come with you on Easter Sunday, that would be great too. So all right. That's the point there. Um, so, so today I'm continuing a little series on preparation. Um, basically thinking about uh, what's coming in terms of the book and book clubs and conversations. And the the New Testament really says prepare ourselves for several things. The two main things are spiritual opposition, spiritual warfare. And the second thing is uh, that's really talked about quite a bit in the New Testament is the return of Jesus. The second coming, as some call it, the return of Jesus. He came once, the first advent, that's what we celebrate at Christmas time, the little baby in the manger and all that jazz. Second coming will be a king on on a horse to judge the world, judge the nations. Second coming of Christ. Several years ago, a friend of mine, a businessman, told me a sad story of lost opportunity. And I think everybody has those, right? Oh, well, my uncle had some land in Oklahoma and sold it for a pittance, and then they struck oil on it, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So he told me a sad story. Uh, a soda bottle, a soda water, sodi? <laughs> soda, soda bo- a soda water bottle company. Fanta, Coke, Sprite. Everybody with me? Yeah, it's hard to. Uh, executive was leaving his very lucrative management job to start a new beverage company. And he wanted my friend, my businessman friend, uh, to bankroll his new company, to give him uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars to, to uh, start his new business. And uh, except there was one problem with the idea that this new beverage company was going to bottle and sell water. What? Water? <laughs> Water, not soda, not milk, not alcohol, just water. And of course, my friend laughed big at the idea and turned down the investment opportunity. Who's going to pay for something in a bottle you can get for free out of the tap? That was his logic. And then he finally said, if only I could see just a little way down the road, I would be filthy rich today. 2017 was when the bottled bottled water biz passed all soda waters in sales. Take them all, add them up, 
people bought more bottled water in 2017 than all of that other stuff combined. So, he's not wealthy. Of course, of course it's true. If any of us could see down the road, we would be rich, right? Or at least prepared for what was coming. And make better choices maybe, or make choices accordingly. So this morning and next Sunday, we are going to take a look down the road to see what the Bible says is surely coming. And hopefully, hopefully we'll be prepared for the certain future that began with the birth of Jesus and will end with his return in power and glory to reign as the great king on the earth. Let's get ready. That's what I'm saying. So there are several facets of the return of Jesus that we will explore this morning. There are four I'm going to, going to go through pretty quickly. His return is imminent and indefinite. And you go, come on, Gino, those words don't even go together. And if you're, if you're that far ahead and you're thinking, hold that thought. His return is imminent and indefinite. His return will be personal and, pro and physical. His return will be visible and surprising at the same time. His return will be finally triumphant and glorious. You got that? Imminent and indefinite, personal and physical, visible and surprising, triumphant and glorious. And there it is. Now, this is just one artist's re rendering. I like it because it's colorful, and if you could see it close up, you see there's all, all kinds of people are in there. Angels are mixed up with the people, and all kinds of stuff is happening there. There's only one real problem with this picture, and it's a significant problem. Jesus is way too small. That's why I just want to say that. Okay. But I, I did like this one. I like the rainbow and all that stuff, so I, I uh, you know. Uh, it, when I have time, after I finish the words part of a, of a sermon, I go looking for stuff. And I looked at a lot of, a lot of things before I found this guy, and I, I really like him a lot. All right. So let's begin. His return is imminent and indefinite. Um, and we're going to begin with the, some portions of the teaching of Jesus. And it, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all have significant passages where Jesus is teaching about his, his return, his second coming. You find the longest passage in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. You'll find a significant passage in Mark 13, the chapter of Mark 13 and chapter 21 in Luke. So if you were to go and read those uh, four chapters all together, you'd have a pretty good handle on what Jesus taught. But here is a portion of Luke's uh, uh, version, all right, Luke 21. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. People fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. So uh, as Jesus is returning, the earth will feel it and will react. That's what that is. There will be signs in the heavens and on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming, those who are alive, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Re say power. power. Say great glory. Great glory. That's, that's how he's coming back uh, the second time. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. This would be the ultimate uh, end of our redemption in Christ. Now, that was Jesus teaching. Other personalities in the New Testament repeated some of these ideas. Here is Peter uh, speaking in Acts chapter 3. Repent, therefore. Repent, therefore, those of you that are far from Christ. Repent and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, that he, God the Father, may send the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things, for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. And that's a very pregnant phrase, the restoring of, of all the things. Uh, and that's a whole lot of our, what our conversation can be about when we talk about heaven. Here's the Apostle Paul. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The writer of the book of Hebrews, the author of which only God knows. Don't let anybody tell you they know. Uh, it's left without a, an author on purpose. Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. 
So I might just ask a little preacher question. Are we eagerly waiting for him? Or is it a yawn and a nod, right? Here's James. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. That's all. Be patient. Wait patiently for the coming of the Lord because he's coming. Millard Erickson in, in a, a fundamental theological text used by seminary students just called Christian Theology says this, the second coming is one of the most widely taught doctrines in the New Testament. This is not a side issue. And even though you haven't heard many sermons on this, I'm trying to make up for that with this week and next Sunday and then I'll come back and talk about heaven. But, but it's not a side issue in the New Testament. Uh, Erickson says one of the most widely taught in the entire New Testament. So when we say it's imminent, it means it's about to happen. It could happen any time. And some are like, well, no, you know, there's some things that have to happen before, before he comes back. Well, uh, I think there, we could disagree about that. And, but that's okay. I think he can come back any time. I don't think he uh, has to wait on anything in particular. Um, okay, I said it was imminent. I think it's, uh, I, can, I should also say, not, I don't think, I know for sure. I should say it's indefinite. It's imminent, meaning it could happen any time, but nobody knows when that will happen, right? Indefinite um, and I imminent. Uh, again, this is Erickson. While the fact of the second coming is very emphatically and clearly asserted in Scripture, the time is not. No one knows the day or the hour. So here is um, Jesus in Mark 13, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Say, no one knows. No one knows. Now you're right there with Jesus. No one knows. That's what he said very clearly. No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And I, I just have to have a preacherly aside here. Why do so many people say they know? When I was much younger, uh, in the middle 1980s, a long time ago, I was an associate pastor of a church, and I had a little office with a desk and a table and chairs, and on my little table by the chairs, I had this little book, 88 Reasons Why He Will Come in 1988, <laughs> which is about 40 years ago, right? Something like that, 30 years ago? How bad is my math? That's about 40 years ago, yeah? 32, that's close to 40, right? <laughs> Closer to 40 than to zero, I'll tell you that. But I had the book there before 1988. That was my point. Had it there like 1986, 87. So, <laughs> say no one knows. No one knows. Not even the son. The father's going to tell the son before he tells you or some hyperplectic <laughs> preacher somewhere. Good gracious. <laughs> but then Jesus goes on. Be on guard. It could happen any time. Keep awake. I'm going to say in a minute, he doesn't mean never sleep. He means something else. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. Amen. All right. Jesus repeatedly taught that his followers needed to be watchful and ready for his imminent, indefinite return. He used parables to do this, including, for example, uh, a parable of two men in the field, working in the field, or two women grinding grain. One is taken and one is left. Another one, the thief in the night that broke into the house, and if the owner had known, would have done something about it. And then a, a very famously in Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. And maybe these are things you're not aware of. Just read the text. You'll see Jesus taught over and over and over and over again that we need to be ready for his return. We need to prepare for his return. And just to, when we conclude here, I'm going to give you some ideas on how to do that. All right. He said that he could come at any time, that no one knew the day or the hour. Both of these truths go together. He could come at any time, but no one knows when he's coming. All right. His point is for us to get ready and to remain vigilant. Now, some of us could legitimately say, well, the church has been vigilant or maybe trying to be vigilant for like a couple of millennia, Gino. Can't we, can't we close the door on this and say it's not imminent? That's a really good question. I don't think we can, but that's all I'm going to say about it this morning. Come next week. I have more to say <laughs> next week. You, you, you should be very glad when I say, I can't tell you everything I know all at once. 
We'd be here a long time, right? All right. His return will be imminent and indefinite. It will also be personal and physical. Personal. Why are these words important? Personal. Jesus will not be sending an envoy in his place. He will not be sending an ambassador to represent him. He will return personally to usher in the end of the age. Personally. We get um, a good uh, hint or teaching on this when we think about or we read about, about the ascension in Acts chapter 1. So here we are. Jesus is saying the last words to his disciples before he ascends to heaven is gone. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Say, a cloud. A cloud cloud took him out of their sight, which is pretty cool. Um, It may be that in our resurrected bodies, we can ride on clouds. I I don't know, but I think that's pretty cool. All right. (laughs) I'm always amazed to, uh, you know, I've read a good bit as a, a theological student, but I'm always amazed to read further on it and say, no, you can't say that because of this. But anyway, I, and I think it's pretty cool that he was on a cloud. Maybe we can be. Ride a cloud. Ride a cloud. Some things happened in my head that I don't not say to you. All right. While they were gazing into heaven, he went. As he went, behold, two men stood, stood by in white robes. Hint, hint, probably angels. And said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? You know, I, I, little aside here. Uh, first time I was in New York, it was like I was looking for Jesus. <laughs> Had never seen uh, those, kind, those buildings like that. All right, that's what they were doing. They were, they were gazing intently at what just happened. And the angels appeared and said, why are you doing that? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. All right? He's going to return on a cloud or in the sky. That's what he says. And he will come personally, which is really good news. You say, well, there will be so many people waiting for him. I'll never get to him. Yeah, you will. Just, you just may have to wait in line, but you get to, you get to be with Jesus. <laughs> okay, so here are some uh, theological ideas that are really important. He will not come, or his return will not be in some hidden, obscure fashion. Or in some corner of the world where no one has ever traveled. So when you hear people talk about, oh, he returned, he returned, but it was in Croatia, behind a house, you know, near a dump. What? You know, these stories float around, or uh, I'm not going to tell you the ones I've heard. That's all right. Um, Nor will his return occur in some merely mystical or spiritual manner where only the enlightened few can even tell that he's returned. The Bible teaches nothing like that, but men do. Okay, just pay attention. You'll hear people talk about, oh, he returned in 1947, and he was at blah, 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 and he has children, you know. Or or, um, the Spirit of the Christ has descended, and Lord X knows where he is. Well, you know. All that is is Gnostic heresy. Okay. His return will not be hidden or obscure or merely mystical. He will return in person. That's why we say that. It's really important. In person. And his in person will be physical. It will be personal and physical. Now, I, have to, I do have to nuance physical body because Jesus is in his resurrection body. But it is a body. He can walk and touch the ground. He can make, he can cook fish. He can build a fire. He can eat food. He can also walk through doors and fly on clouds. What a thing. I hope I get a model like that. That's all, in a resurrection body. But it is still a body. And this is really important. Um, I'm jumping way ahead. We'll get there in several weeks. But our... Our resurrection life will be an amazing thing in a restored, like, supercharged body. So, like, right now it's, you know, a bicycle. Then it will be a challenger with a Hemi or whatever. Or maybe, I should say, an electric plane. You know, it's it's a 
difference. Maybe that didn't help you at all. Anyway, <laughs> personal, <laughs> physical, be a resurrection body. Um, uh, and currently, Christ dwells in our heart by faith because the Holy Spirit dwells in us, right? So we have a sense of his presence by the, by the mystical union that we have in, uh, through the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I want to suggest this. This is not uh, in the Bible, but I think this is true, that even in our resurrected um, uh, selves or resurrected bodies, we will still have a great sense of Christ's presence with us. And the Holy Spirit is going to be with us still. Uh, and then, but then we will be able to go somewhere and meet with Jesus. I think it both will be true. Okay. Now, um, all right, that's all. He, he will come in the same way in which he, he left. So that we, he'll be, he will return in a physical and uh, personal way. His return also will be visible and surprising. Visible and surprising. Here are two texts. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Now listen, listen to three things. Will descend from heaven. Here he comes back riding on the clouds. He will descend from heaven with a cry of command. A cry in English doesn't quite get it. It means a, with a loud voice. Because cry can mean, Aah! but uh, he's crying out. It's a loud, it's a loud voice, right? So we will see him and we will hear him. From heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel. Not only will, the, will, the, will this be this thunderous cry of command, but then an archangel is going to pipe up. What do they sound like? I, I, I want to suggest to you it's probably an amazing thing, much, much greater than Niagara Falls. You've got to think like that, all right? Cry of command, the voice of an arch, archangel, then my favorite, of the sound of the trumpet of God. Or whatever, however, that's pretty close, by the way. It's going to be. But you, so let me, say, let me say it a different way. Three loud noises. Three loud sounds. It will be impossible to miss. That's Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4. And then here's another one, Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. Which eye will not see him? None. I think even the blind eyes will be open to see him. Yes. Every eye will see him. Those who pierced, even those who pierced him, those who just reject him, right? And all tribes on the earth will wail, will wail on account of him because there will be some weeping and gnashing of teeth. Even so, amen. Which means, oh, come on, Jesus, do your thing. So I'm not, I don't even need to preach on that. Those two texts get that. Visible and surprising. That day will catch many off guard. It's going to happen. Um, say off guard. off guard. All right. Jesus compared his generation, and by extension all generations after his, with the unprepared generation of Noah, people who refused to believe that a flood could come on the earth, people who had never seen rain. They said, you, it's not only going to rain, but it's going to rain enough to flood the earth. I don't think so. The weatherman doesn't think so either, Noah. That was a joke. I y'all are kind of, I don't know. <laughs> Noah's generation was unprepared. And they had, that generation had for several years, the sign of Noah building a giant boat in a field. What are you doing, Noah? I'm building a boat. Why? A flood's coming. What's a flood? Well, first there's rain. What's rain? It's stuff from the sky, and there's going to be a bunch of it. Oh, a boat. A boat for rain, which we've never seen, and a flood, which we've never, under, never heard of. How about that? Crazy man. They also had his preaching, his testimony. So they had a sign, and they had words. Guess what our generation has? A sign, the resurrection of Jesus, which we'll celebrate on Easter. And they have words, yours and mine. And they will be unprepared. They will be caught, as the Bible says, unawares. Here is Jesus in Matthew 24. For as, me, as, for as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Let me pause right here. That just means they were conducting life, just living life normally, right? Until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. And so will, be, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. It'll be the same way. So guess when they believed? It was a little bit late. They believed when the water was swirling around their feet. Um, if there are unbelievers in your life space, talk to them. Let them not be caught unawares. It, it's a little bit late when the water is swirling around your feet. Or when the trumpet call of God is sounding in the heavens and the skies are rolled back and Jesus appears everywhere all at once. It will be judgment at that point and not grace. Louis Burkhoff, a, a famous Protestant theologian, wrote this. The measure of surprise, the measure of surprise at the second coming of Christ will be in an inverse ratio. I know you guys know I can't do math, but I can say math words. <laughs> will be in an inverse ratio to the measure of their watchfulness. You get that? Inverse ratio to the measure of that. It, how prepared are you? Your surprise will be increased in the manner of uh, how little watchfulness you've, you, how, how, little, how little prepared you are. That's all he's saying. So let's get ready so we're not too surprised by that. Jesus, as, as you know, used the analogy of the thief in the night to exhort and encourage the church. Um, Paul used that in the, the, uh, the uh, letter to the Thessalonians, the, to the, the church in the city of Thessalonica. He goes, Thessalonians, excuse me, he, Thessalonica. He went uh, in a long uh, text talking about the thief in the night and how to get ready. So I'm, I'm going to do the text. It's um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. So um, I'm going to do it in two parts. Uh, here's Paul. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You're fully aware. You've been taught this. This is one of the analogies that Jesus used and his disciples and the apostle Paul all picked up on it. And they talked about Jesus will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, and which is the point of the warning so that those who believe will not be caught unawares, but rather we will be prepared. That's the point which I hope you understand by now is the point of this particular sermon. You are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Keep awake and be sober. He is not teaching that we should never sleep. Sleep is a euphemism for being dull in life, for not believing what we've been taught. He is teaching that we should not live a life of carousing, just having as much fun as we can, period. But a life, a rather a life that befits those who belong to Jesus. Okay, this lengthy passage, he continues in this way. Here's uh, uh, verses 7 through 11. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. Okay? I'll leave that there. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. So he's saying there, there are two kinds of people in this, in these, um, in this idea, in this, um, in this teaching here. Just two kinds. Those that are in the darkness and asleep and drunk. Unaware, uncaring, dulling their senses. And then there are those of the light who are awake and watchful and sober. There's a dividing line. It says, We belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. You've heard those words before. Verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, 
so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. So here now he's talking about just regular physical sleep. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So we are to encourage one another to live well, to pay attention, to be alert, to not um, get, to, to not fall into discouragement or come quickly out of discouragement that says he's never coming back. Let's just ignore that. So the main thing I want us to take from this text is this. We should find our lives in Christ. Uh, we should live our lives in Christ in such a way that we are alert and that everything we do, every hour of every day, every activity of every day is thoughtful, is um, alert, is sober, that we don't give our senses away to, to activities. Uh, uh, so in my heart, honestly, there's, there's a lot of mercy at this point because I know that we carry a lot of pain. I know that. And I know that we dull our senses just to dull the pain at least for a little while. I get that. I don't think the Apostle Paul is talking about that, although that's not a good practice. I don't want to say that that's okay because I don't think it's okay. I think it's uh, dangerous. But he's just talking about a life in general pointed away from Christ of unbelief and therefore carousing and darkness and drunkenness it just these things kind of all go to kind of go together not for everybody but i would say for many many people high percentage he's saying don't live like that as followers of christ be alert and be ready his return is imminent and indefinite so uh, just a question does your faith in jesus condone all of the activities in which you find yourself does your faith in Jesus, will, would, if Jesus were there with you, would he say, well done? It's a simple rule of thumb. Okay. Let that be your guide. Let that be your guide. Not the culture, not your friends, not your family. If Jesus were here with me, would he say, okay, all right? Let's give our ways, our lives to Christ. And then the last descriptors, his return will be triumphant and glorious triumphant and glorious the main thing here is to consider the contrast between the first and second coming in his first coming he was born to a poor family in a forgotten corner of the Roman Empire he was raised in obscurity and never traveled far from his home he was rejected by his own people and finally betrayed executed as a criminal on charges of sedition and buried in a borrowed tomb. I'm stopping right there. Of course, he was raised from the dead, but that's, that's how you would judge his first coming. Boy, that was pretty difficult. At his second coming, he will appear in the sky. We've already looked at that. Where every eye will behold him. No more obscurity for Lord Jesus. He will be riding on a white horse. That's, I haven't talked about that, but it's in the Revelation. Which is a sign of his royal status as king of kings and lord of lords, and I should probably say as conquering king. His coming will be preceded by the trumpet call of God and the shout of an archangel, among other things, and every person on earth will bow before him and acknowledge him as Lord. Man, what a contrast, don't you think? His return will be triumphant and glorious. Here is Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him. That's our little, our little picture, right? All the angels with Him. Then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, no exceptions. And He will separate people one from another as shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will sit on the throne as conquering king and judge of all the earth. Which means boss, man. Um, cosmic CEO. I don't know how many, time, many things I can say here, but that's who Jesus, that's what all that stuff means. He came the first time in humiliation. When he returns, he will come in exaltation, in triumph, and in glory. That's what we have to look forward to. Yay, come Jesus! Yes. And everybody that is on his team is going to have a place in the kingdom. That's the thing. 
That's our cat. That's our guy. <laughs> you know, we wear jerseys, football and basketball jerseys with, on the names, names on the back, you know, of our favorite person, Breeze, right? I don't know who you're, Manning. I don't know who your people are. Um, uh, James, like LeBron James. That, that's my guy. He's my guy. Whoa, man, that does not compare at all to us saying, that's my guy. Yeah. The one on the throne, that's my dude. I'm with him. It, it might be hard for us to say he's with me. That may be hard, but we can say I'm with him. I'm with him. Okay. His return is imminent and indefinite. It will be personal and physical. It's visible and surprising, triumphant and glorious. I've done my best to describe this. I hope it makes you hungry for it. But the time to repair, somebody, somebody's with me. The time to prepare is now. So how do we do that? How do we prepare? I have a simple thought for you that can go in lots of ways. How would you prepare yourself and your family to re, and your home? How would you prepare yourself and your family and your home to receive the royal family? There we go. Is it Harry? Harry and Harry and Megan? Did I get that right? So just, just is that right? Did I get their names right? Okay, so Harry and Megan say, I'm coming over. I'll be there tomorrow about the same time. What? What are you going to do? You're going to take a bath. <laughs> You're probably going to bathe your kids. Well, you don't, say what? Buy a hat. Oh, will you buy a house? I don't know. Buy oh, buy a hat. All right. <laughs> so, I think each one of us will get in a different way, maybe. <laughs> that's good. That's fine. So, so use your imagination. Harry and Megan are coming over. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to your house? I think I, we might dust ours for the first time in a while. <laughs> nope. My wife is a great house. Hey, don't even think that. My wife is a great housekeeper. That was not meant as a slight on her whatsoever. Golly, you people go to the wrong place all the time. We'll do it. We'll What's that? Mow the yard. Mow the yard. <laughs> we have one person that said she would mow the grass. Mow the grass. And for some of us, that dog, pick up the poop, right? We do, we do all kinds of things, would we not, to prepare for Harry and Meghan's arrival. We're, we're going to put on a feast. We're not going to give them bologna sandwiches. Would it be offensive? We might even get Earl Grey tea. I don't know. Isn't it, isn't it certain that we would bring out the best and we would prepare ourselves in the best way? That's just for Harry and Meghan. That's not the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So how do we prepare? We make sure our spiritual house is in order and our heart is clean toward him and toward one another, right? We prepare ourselves to be in the presence of the one who loved us and gave his life for us. So when, if Jesus were coming over to your house, we're not just receiving an honored guest. We're receiving someone who has paid the highest price that we might be in his presence. He loved us. I, he said, I'm here. I'm here to... to, to uh, how do I say this? I'm here to, to bring home to you the enormity of my affection for you. And I am very glad to be here and to receive your affection. And in that moment, nothing, nothing, else, nothing else is going to matter. Not one thing. Because that's perfect. It'll be perfect. And our hearts, dearly beloved, that all seems our hearts to yearn for Jesus like this because that's what we'll be receiving. It will be personal. It'll be very personal. In every sore spot, every injustice, every broken place, he'll heal. It will be an amazing thing. I, I hope I've stimulated your imagination this morning and that your heart yearns for Christ. 
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are among those who look forward to your return, your son Jesus. We long to hear him say, well done, well done. You were faithful. You bore witness in hard times. Stay true. And we long for the day when all things will be made right, all things will be made new. We long for the day when every eye will see you, every, every tongue will offer you praise, every knee will bow, or at least confess, and also confess, tongue confess. And we can be, we can be there among the great company, not a small company, the great, the enormous company of those who belong to you. Or what a, what, a, what a day that will be. And I pray, Lord, that the realization of these things would settle deep in our hearts to our, every fiber, fiber of our being so that we, um, as individuals and then as a company, as a, a, a group of people, we would encourage one another with these words. He is coming. He is coming. So cause our faith, Lord, to be enlarged to embrace this. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, I always like to shout a little bit. So uh, can we shout the, I believe it's Aramaic, Maranatha? Can we say that? One, two, three. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. One more time. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. All right. Uh, I'll be down here with PJ and uh, others. We'll be down here to pray with you. Uh, but I want you to know that uh, the Lord loves you. And if you have or, uh, some need of some kind, he will meet you as we pray with you. So don't, don't just walk out. Get, some, get whatever it is that you need today in Jesus' name. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.